Our next speaker, as you all can read, <laughs> Linda Evans of Macquarie University, Ancient Egyptian and Egyptological Attitudes Toward the Natural World. <laughs> okay. What did the ancient Egyptians think of their environment? Like other civilizations, they were dependent on natural resources for their survival. But nature seems to have held special significance for them because many environmental features, such as plants, animals, landmarks, were the focus of religious, philosophical, and artistic expression. Indeed, it's impossible to think of Egyptian culture without referring to natural symbols and motifs. Despite this, the Egyptians' relationship with their environment has largely been taken for granted. Our knowledge of this association, essential to an empathetic understanding of their society, is consequently quite superficial and possibly distorted. We know that theirs was a more immediate and rela uh, relationship with the environment than that of modern Western society, encompassing both mundane and supernat supernatural dimensions. But how did the Egyptian people actually relate to the physical environment? The answer to this question is important because the way they viewed their surroundings will have influenced how they reacted to both environmental opportunities and challenges. Did they intrinsically work with nature or against it? Furthermore, as historians living in the modern world, how do our ideas about nature affect how we interpret ancient responses to the environment? Yes, good. Our perception of the environment forms part of our worldview. A worldview is the set of fundamental assumptions that we hold about life and the universe, what we believe does and does not exist, what things are right or wrong, and so on. Worldviews are a product of our upbringing and everyday experiences, rendering them culturally dependent. The people of a given society thus tend to share certain assumptions, which may differ from those held in other groups. People also share certain attitudes about the natural world. Following uh, the environmental crisis of the 1960s, various disciplines from psychology to philosophy have sought to categorize these opinions in order to predict and manage social response to environmental issues such as climate change. For example, philosopher John Passmore identifies three fundamental attitudes. Mankind as a despot, characterized by an anthropocentric arrogance towards nature. Second, a steward responsible for keeping nature safe. And third, as a cooperative partner in which humans strive to improve nature. Other proposed typologies, which you can see here, um, have divided human response to the environment differently. But in general, they all tend to identify two diametrically opposed reactions. Either an anthropocentric perspective marked by domination of nature or an ecocentric attitude in which humans comply with nature. For the present analysis, however, I prefer the more nuanced typology proposed by anthropologist Florence Cluckhone, who identified people subjected to nature, living at the mercy of what they perceive as a highly unpredictable environment, people as an integral part of nature, striving for harmony with the environment, and people against nature, manipulating and controlling the environment. Cluckhoe noted, for example, that many ancient societies viewed natural phenomena as expressions of divine will, which humans were helpless to control, such as medieval European cultures who often associated remote mountaintops or deep forests with the supernatural and demonic. In contrast, native peoples often see themselves as an inherent part of nature, such as the Pueblo Indians of the American Southwest, who view the sky, land, and animals as family members, or the Achuri Pygmies of Zaire, who believe that their forest home is a living entity that is intimately concerned with their well-being. Many Eastern philosophical traditions have also viewed nature as sacred and a force that humans must flow with and adapt to. In Western society, however, the most prevalent view, until recently at least, has been that humans are separate from nature. This attitude is frequently ascribed to our Judeo-Christian heritage. Created in God's image and granted dominion over animals, we were to enact his will by controlling and civilizing the natural world. Christianity thus encouraged a particular attitude towards nature, that it, exi it exists primarily as a resource rather than something to be contemplated with enjoyment, that we have the right to use it as we will, and that our relationship with it is not governed by moral principles. What then was the most prevalent view of nature in ancient Egyptian society? Can we even determine this objectively? 
As our worldviews tend to guide human behaviour, it's possible that feelings about the natural world would be reflected in artefacts that preserve both former activities and cultural expressions. Thus, art, literature and religious beliefs, together with archaeological evidence of interactions with the environment, might potentially offer insights into the Egyptian worldview, although admittedly only that held by the country's elite. To date, however, hypotheses about what the Egyptians thought of their surroundings have only been considered occasionally and then most often based primarily on religious texts. Although the focus has been primarily on their perception of animals, the overwhelming consensus has nevertheless suggested an attitude similar to Cluckhone's second value category, that the Egyptian people experienced a harmonious relationship with the natural world. Much of this work can be traced back to Eric Hornung, who concluded that because creation texts do not single out or treat as different the creation of human beings from that of other living things, they were thus considered equal in the eyes of the Egyptians. The relationship of humans with animals was not as their master, for only their divine creator could fill this role, but as partners. Herman Tevelder also saw a markedly different attitude towards animals, towards animals than from, from our own, stating that, quote, in the Egyptian worldview, man did not occupy such a dominant position against the animal world as we have adopted almost as a matter of course following from the Judeo-Christian or humanistic tradition. Philip Schumond also viewed, views the creation myths as, quote, the key to the Egyptians' conception of their relationship with their natural surroundings. But goes, he goes further to suggest that their cosmogonies, quote, shared the belief that the original creative force made all things, but did not arrange them according to any preordained hierarchy. According to this conception, humans occupied a place level with and not superior to all other creatures. From this flowed quite naturally a belief in the universal nature of creation, which led in turn to a harmonious relationship with all its elements, whether mineral, vegetable or animal. However, does equality in creation correspond to equality in status? While the texts show that all living things share, shared a life force granted to them by the Creator God, did this mean that the boundaries between them were blurred, such that in fundamental differences became irrelevant? Is it really feasible that the Egyptian people placed as much value on the plant and animal worlds as they did their own existence? If so, then this would have affected at a profound level how they viewed their relationship with and obligations to the environment, encouraging an acceptance of the status quo and a reticence to assert human interests. In line with Cluckhone's second value category, we would expect the Egyptians to regard all natural forces and man himself as one harmonious whole, to disregard differences between themselves and animals, to view all nature and to, to value all nature, and to create the, to treat the environment with respect and restraint. But does the evidence actually support such a harmonious response? Well, let's look at the data. First. Were animals viewed as equal to humans? Well, the question of human uniqueness has been the subject of heated debate since the development of Greek philosophy, with reason and language identified as crucial attributes that differentiate us from animals. For many, their apparent lack of these abilities places animals outside of human experience. If the ancient Egyptians instead considered themselves to be on a par with animals, we would not expect the latter to be treated as other, but to share important features with humans. I suggest, however, that the same creation texts that appear to show equality between people and animals by listing humans alongside other creatures, in fact indicate that, that differences were perceived between the two. Each text usually lists a set of prototypical creatures that were intended to represent the whole of creation for which the god was responsible. Cattle, birds and reptiles are mentioned most frequently, but other creatures such as fish or worms can also be named. The lists are not random collections but refer to animal groups that seem to correspond quite closely to our modern taxonomic divisions of mammals, birds, reptiles, fish and invertebrates. Such divisions are based on fundamental differences between animals, of which the Egyptians were clearly also aware. As humans and the gods are listed in addition to these animal groups, they must also have been perceived as separate and different from them. 
Certainly one text implies an, an inequality between humans and animals by specifying that the latter were created for human use. She's a well tended as mankind, God's cattle. He made sky and earth for their sake. He made for them plants and cattle, fowl and fish to feed them. Visual representations indicate that the Egyptians also used behaviour to differentiate humans for the, from the rest of the animal kingdom. In tomb scenes, animals are depicted in exacting detail, including their natural behaviour. Animal life is illustrated honestly and explicitly to show acts of mating, birth, aggression, defecation and so on. Such behaviour, however, is the very antithesis of that exhibited by humans in the same wall scenes, where strict rules of decorum prevail. This is especially so for the elite, who constantly maintain their composure in stiff, unyielding poses. But although the movements of the lower classes are more dynamic, their behaviour is still constrained. Intercourse, pregnancy and childbirth were not represented. Eating and drinking are rare. Despite occasional depictions of violence or overt sadness, the humans in tomb scenes, unlike animals, reliably control their bodies and their emotions. To the extent that animals do the opposite of what was considered socially correct, it suggests that the Egyptians viewed them as different from people. From this perspective, it's just a small step away from considering animals as other and consequently free from moral obligation by humans. Their unequal status is also implied in satirical imagery, such as the Turin papyrus, which shows animals, quote, behaving like humans, the world turned upside down. These images provide insights into the functioning of New Kingdom society, but by casting animals into the world of humans, they simultaneously show how they do not belong there, as it is their otherness in these roles that creates the intended humour. Indeed, if the animals act like humans on one side of the Turin papyrus, then explicit scenes of sexual intercourse that are displayed by couples on the other side might equally be said to show humans behaving like animals. The world turned upside down indeed. Next, given the striking focus on flora and fauna in their artefacts, can we say that the Egyptians valued all nature without prejudice? While they undoubtedly made use of a wide variety of natural resources in their practical lives, what did they nevertheless choose to celebrate in their cultural lives? In 1905, Victor Leray was sure that careful recording of the animals depicted on monuments would allow Egypt's fauna during the pharaonic era to be reconstructed. No doubt Leray's strong conviction was due to the seemingly rich range of species that it is displayed in every facet of Egyptian culture, from art to religion. However, subsequent ex examination of birds, fish and mammal images has revealed that in fact only a subset of Egypt's fauna is represented. Patrick Houlihan recently compiled a systematic list of all the animals that can be identified unambiguously in Egyptian art and hieroglyphs, locating 55 mammals, 72 birds, 8 reptiles, 2 amphibians, 32 fish and 14 invertebrates for a total of 183 species. Although John Wyatt's um, ornithological studies have since increased the number of recognised bird species to 211, in reality, Egypt hosts 132 mammals, 514 birds, 98 reptiles and amphibians, 460 fish species and over 8,000 invertebrates for a total of 9,600 species. The ancient representations, a total then of 100, 322 species, thus represent just 4% of the available fauna. Even if the large number of invertebrates um, is omitted, the depicted species still comprise just 28% of Egypt's animals. The number of creatures with religious significance is even more constrained, with just 30 species known to have had an association with Egyptian deities, and the same animals often assigned to multiple gods. Seemingly more species are referred to in texts. Lexicographical studies of ancient Egyptian fauna have identified the names for approximately 600 animals, gleaned largely from funerary and medical texts, yet this represents just 6% of Egypt's fauna. Furthermore, many of the terms identified are assigned to the same species. For example, 10% of the names refer to cattle alone. Consequently, the number of creatures recognised is again somewhat limited. Indeed, many animals are either not found at all in cultural material or are known from just one or a handful of somewhat dubious examples. 
set against frequent representations of, for example, cattle, gazelle and hippopotamus, are rare images of equally common animals such as pigs, bats and mice. There are no unambiguous depictions of spiders in pharaonic art, which cannot be due to fear because other creatures that might equally be considered dangerous, such as the scorpion, were represented frequently. So archaeological studies have also confirmed that the number of animals depicted underrepresents the range of species actually exploited, and furthermore, repeatedly emphasises particular species for which physical evidence is largely absent. Thus, while the breadth of fauna represented in Egyptian art and text seems at first glance to be impressive, some species were clearly favoured over others. The variety and frequency of animals rep uh, illustrated within this nevertheless narrow range has, I suggest, given the impression of a general appreciation of all fauna, when in reality, Egyptian interest was much more focused. Plants, which also figured in art, text and, and, and architecture, as well as religious observance, present a similar picture of species abundance. Despite their cultural presence, however, relatively few studies have attempted to document the species represented. Early work by Franz Wernig traced the impact of a range of plants on various aspects of Egyptian life through an examination of art, architecture and inscriptions, an approach also undertaken by Ludwig Keimer in which he identified approximately 40 plants of major cultural and economic significance. To my knowledge, however, no list has yet been compiled that fully documents the vegetation represented in art, but plants referred to in texts have been identified with greater success. Victor Leray was able to describe some 200 species, both mentioned in texts and found in physical remains, and more recently studies focusing primarily on medical papyri have distinguished approximately 160 plant-based ingredients, however of these only a fifth of them have been formally identified. Once again, these figures must be viewed in light of Egypt's total flora. Over 2,000 plant species are known in Egypt today, of which approximately 700 species are found commonly. Thus, while organic forms are strongly associated with Egyptian culture, it appears that the number of plants commemorated in art and texts, even without knowing precisely which species are recorded, represents just a small portion of the full range of vegetation. Documenting other types of environmental phenomena in Egyptian art and texts, such as water features, the sky, climate and landscape, is challenging, as data are patchy. As Janet Richard notes, Richards notes, natural unmodified landscapes are rare in ancient Egyptian art. No word for or concept of landscape, per se, existed. Nevertheless, references to landscape features do occur in texts. The terms used to identify the Egyptians' territory, such as Tawi and Kemet, consistently highlight its physical geography. Toponyms also targeted prominent geological features, such as hills and mountains, while abundant terms for minerals point to appreciation of different types of geological materials. Some environmental events were also recorded, such as the rise and fall of the Nile. And meteorological phenomena, such as wind and rain, were occasionally acknowledged, but like passing references to the sun, moon and stars, usually without detailed description. Deities could be made manifest in environmental elements, such as the sun, moon, sky, earth and the Nile, but in these various guises they were usually represented anthropomorphically, not as the phenomena themselves. Similarly, few geographical features occur in tomb scenes, apart from deserts depicted as undulating granular terrain and bodies of water presented as unnatural rectangles marked with wave lines. Curiously, the annual inundation failed to register visually apart from indirect allusions in cattle scenes with the animal's four deep water canals. Clouds and rain are unknown in visual imagery, but representations of the stylized sun disk and sky and the star-studded ceilings of tomb and temple chambers illustrate basic astronomical features. Some see geographical allusions in the layout of tomb scenes, such that the arrangement of images on the walls corresponds to the natural juxtaposition of swampland, floodplain and desert locations. Landscape vistas are also apparent um, in the organisation of temples, the walls, columns, roof and floor of which mimicked attributes of the riverine environment, while the structures themselves may have been oriented to either the Nile or to astronomical phenomena. Taken together, however, it appears that only a subset of environmental phenomena was acknowledged by the Egyptians, with many aspects overlooked. Of course, the incomplete nature of the archaeological record has affected the available evidence. 
Also, they could not possibly be aware of all the flora, fauna and landscape features in their territory, and so the characteristics represented culturally will inevitably be limited. Nevertheless, clear preferences for some aspects over others would seem to indicate that something other than general enjoyment of nature drove the choice of subjects. And finally, I'd like to explore how the Egyptians responded to their, their surroundings. What physical effect did they have on the environment? Well, first, water. Throughout the pharaonic uh, period, the Nile was viewed, of course, as a valuable resource that could be tapped in many different ways, but which often required changes to not only the natural flow of the river, but the surrounding countryside as well. Attempts to modify natural flood irrigation began early in Egypt's history, as revealed by an apparent canal digging scene on the Scorpion Mace Head, and recent reinterpretation of imagery from Neusara's temple, which you can see at the bottom. References to irrigation works uh, certainly occur in funerary and biographical texts of the Old Kingdom, and during the first intermediate period, Keti II recorded the building of a canal near Astute that, quote, made the elevated land a swamp. By the Middle Kingdom, artificial irrigation was well established, driven by an ever-increasing desire to expand the amount of arable land. While in the New Kingdom, irrigation canals were extended yet further to reach hydrologically more challenging land, although ironically this often resulted in saline and waterlogged fields that were unworkable. Consequently, as Chris Eyre notes, by the end of the pharaonic period, truly natural wild flooding had virtually ceased to exist. The land was also modified. As we know, mining for building stone, gemstones and, natural and mineral ores played a vital economic and political role in Egypt's history. To date, over 200 mines, ranging from the pre-dynastic to Roman periods, have been located in the Nile Valley, as despite natural weathering, activities at each site have left permanent marks on the environment. Raw materials were extracted by either open-cut quarries or tunnelling underground. Many quarry sites were vast, extending across several square kilometres, or consisted of linked clusters of, of mines, altering the natural topography to such an extent that Harrell and Stormeyer have observed that, quote, from a physical perspective, we may speak of an ancient quarry landscape. However, the Egyptians' geomorphic manipulation went far beyond just mines to include actual remodelling of the land, as we heard this morning. As Peter Piccioni concluded, quote, the Egyptians were able to reshape external landscapes on a massive scale that often is not appreciated by modern scholarship. For example, levelling large sections of uneven ground, removing thousands of tonnes of rock, quarrying away whole hillsides, reshaping large rock faces, and even to the point of remaking the landscape of an entire valley, such as Der el Bahri. These adaptations and the will to implement them give the impression that the Egyptians viewed their landscapes as something malleable that could be shaped, sculpted and remade. They're thus reminded that while the spectacular stone monuments that resulted from Egyptian ingenuity cannot fail to arrest our attention, the cost of their creation was substantial alteration of the natural contours of the surrounding landscape. From this perspective, even the countless tomb shafts and rock-cut chapels found throughout the country can be viewed as a form of environmental damage. The Egyptians also exerted an impact on animals. Fauna were, of course, fundamental to the economy. As their bodies were a source of essential products as well as services, their exploitation was inevitable. However, Egyptian use of animals was often harsh and exceeded their immediate needs. Tomb scenes show that individual animals could be abused, manhandled, threatened, subjected to, vi to violent force feeding, and roped in readiness for slaughter, while scholars still debate whether the four legs of sacrificial bulls were removed while still alive. Images of animals leashed to ground pegs and osteological evidence showing deformed leg bones confirms that both wild and domesticated species were confined for long periods while the bodies of mummified animals frequently show signs of trauma and disease as a result of poor housing and care prior to their deaths. Animal populations were also subject to manipulation. Like other cultures, the Egyptians experimented with the controlled breeding of livestock. But visual evidence suggests that the domestication of wild species, such as gazelle and hyenas, were similarly attempted. Large-scale breeding programs also took place later in Egypt's history in order to supply the mummification industry, to which the bodies of millions of animals stored in catacombs now bear witness. The remains of hatcheries, large enclosures and texts indicate that many mummified animals were reared in temple sanctuaries for this purpose, but stock were also caught locally as well as imported. 
Indeed, tomb scenes show a range of devices used to catch animals, from clap nets for waterfowl to foot traps for desert ungulates. The latter are sometimes shown corralled in hunting parks, but the varying habitat requirements of the species found together in these enclosures indicate that they have been sourced from different locations to create artificial groupings. When combined with text references to exceptionally large numbers of hunted or herded desert animals, and archaeological evidence showing the gradual decline of some species, such as hearty beast, a picture of species depletion begins to emerge. While human activity was unlikely the sole cause of this, nevertheless, habitat competition and hunting may well have exacerbated the effects of natural environmental changes, pushing some animal populations already experiencing pressure to the point of no return. Thus, a consideration of the Egyptians' impact on water, land and animals often reveals a focus on human interests at the expense of natural phenomena. While some features were undoubtedly appreciated in their natural state, studied closely and imbued with sacred meaning, this did not necessarily prevent their exploitation and transformation. Well, returning now to my original question of Egyptian response to nature, an assessment of the evidence has shown that they probably did not consider animals their equals, that only a subset of environmental features was of cultural interest, and that they exerted a substantial impact on the natural world. These attributes suggest that they did not experience a harmonious relationship with the environment, but instead exhibited an attitude similar to Cluckhone's third value orientation, people against nature, manipulating and controlling the environment, and thus closer to what we think of as a modern response. Indeed, comparison with contemporary Western attitudes is quite revealing. The Egyptian, oh, sorry, surveys have shown that the North American and Japanese public generally express, quote, a love of nature. However, when this attitude is explored in greater depth, it's found to be based on a very limited awareness of and interest in environmental phenomena. Stephen Kellett writes, quote, Japanese appreciation of nature was especially marked by a restricted focus on a small number of species and natural objects often admired in a context emphasizing control, manipulation, and contrivance. Their appreciation was described as a perspective of nature dominated by a preference for the artificial, abstract, and symbolic, rather than any realistic experience of the natural world, and a motivation to touch nature from a controlled and safe distance. Environmental features falling outside the valued aesthetic and symbolic boundaries tended to be ignored, dismissed, or judged unappealing. I would argue that the Egyptians were similarly discriminating in their response to the environment, showing clear preferences for certain attributes. While various reasons may account for why some features appear in the cultural record and not others, I suggest that when we think about the range of benefits afforded by the flora, fauna and landscape features that are represented culturally by the Egyptians, it becomes apparent that the limited range may be connected primarily to their function, such that only those environmental features that had a social, religious, symbolic and or economic role were valued, while other aspects of the natural world were ignored. In other words, the parts of the environment that were acknowledged by the Egyptians and which they undoubtedly knew very well relate quite specifically to their needs, not an appreciation of nature in general. The environmental phenomena the Egyptians did choose to engage with were also highly controlled. In visual representations, natural rep elements were heavily stylized or reduced to symbols, while aspects of the physical environment were actively remodeled or restructured. Nature was mimicked or alluded to, but what was clearly preferred was an abstracted version of it. For example, as noted earlier, temples were designed as a microcosm of the Nile environment, yet if they were actually flooded by the river, as David Jeffries writes, the event was regarded as a little short of a catastrophe, requiring, requiring subsequent purification to remove all trace of their brush with nature. Control was, of course, fundamental to the philosophy of Ma'at. Ma'at encouraged a code of ethical conduct that sought to maintain the order that governed society, but it also identified order in the natural world, made manifest in the reliable rhythms of life with which humankind was equally expected to live in accord. However, to preserve social and natural harmony, sustained action was required to defend both from chaotic elements that might cause imbalance. As Eric Hornung explains, passively adapting to a pre-existing order following it and respecting it 
will not suffice. Rather, this order must be established and actively realised over time and again. Only through proper behaviour and active engagement is world order achieved. As the natural world could be a source of chaos, it was incumbent upon the Egyptians to impose order upon it, for in doing so they were enacting ma'at. To the extent that this required actively transforming and controlling the environment, I suggest that such behaviour indicates that their values were closer to our own than has hitherto been appreciated. So in conclusion, although it is widely accepted that the Egyptians were highly sensitive to nature, examination of the evidence instead reveals an interest that was both narrow and pragmatic. I believe that the tendency by Egyptologists to view the Egyptians as unusually attuned to their environment possibly derives from an unconscious assumption that the people of the past experienced a less dominating relationship with nature than that found today. However, environmental history has shown repeatedly that such a view is mistaken. Indeed, their apparently modern attitude towards nature would suggest that the Egyptians likely faced both environmental opportunities and challenges, not with passive acceptance, but confident determination, as their enduring civilization might lead us to expect. Thank you. Thank you.